Before we can jump into our hypothesis test for a difference of means, we need to establish a few basics about the sampling distribution for a difference of means. We have a formula for standard error, but much like the formulas that we saw for two proportions or for a difference of proportions, we are not responsible for it. You don't have to use this formula to calculate standard error. On homework, you can use the applet, and on tests, the standard error will be provided anytime we're talking about a difference between two means. We have an estimate of degrees of freedom, which is very similar to our degrees of freedom for one mean. Again, we're going with this idea of n minus 1, except we have two different samples and each one of them has an n. So what we do is we say it's a reasonably conservative estimate of our degrees of freedom to take the n from the smaller sample. So that we look at our two n's, whichever is smaller, we just take that smaller n and then subtract 1. There is a formula that gets us a better estimate of degrees of freedom that uh, is very messy and complicated. It's based on this Satterthwaite approximation idea. But we figure that if you want more accuracy, you can use software to get a better estimate of your degrees of freedom. And we don't touch that formula in this course. So anytime we're doing something by hand, our degrees of freedom are just based on the smaller sample. It's going to give you a smaller value of degrees of freedom than the other formula would give you, and we call that a conservative estimate because it's going to make your p-values bigger and it's going to make your margins of error on your confidence intervals bigger so that we're still safe in our conclusions anytime we are concluding that we would reject the null hypothesis. It just makes it a little bit harder to reject. Following again on our ideas from one mean, we have sample size conditions for using the t-distribution. This is the same rule of thumb that we established for one mean, and now it has to hold for both values of n. So this must hold, hold for both n1 and n2. So if either of those sample sizes is smaller than 30, then we want to look at the shape of that distribution. So with these things in mind, we'll go ahead and venture off into our first hypothesis test. A t-statistic is calculated, again, based on this same model of sample statistic minus null parameter or null value divided by standard error. Our sample statistic, anytime we're talking about a difference between two means, is the difference between the two sample means. So x1 bar minus x2 bar. And our null value, what we would set this equal to, uh, mu1 minus mu2 equal to under the null hypothesis, is going to be 0. And so this gets us a very nice, concise formula for our t-statistic. Going into an example, the nutrition study data set includes patients that are undergoing elective surgery to remove a non-cancerous lesion. We can't necessarily assume that this is representative of all adults in the U.S., so we will just assume that any inference we do is subject to a kind of hypothetical population of people who would be going under uh, this similar kind of surgery. We're going to perform a test of hypothesis to address the question of whether Ketele, which is a fancy name for BMI, body mass index, uh, named after I believe the French individual who defined it, differs among smokers and non-smokers, among individuals in this population. So what type of variables do we have first of all? That Ketele body mass index is a quantitative measure that is based on height and weight. So it's a quantitative measure of one's weight in proportion to one's height. So this is quantitative. And the variable smoke, which would have yes and no, or smoker and non-smoker as its values, is categorical.
So we do have the correct kind of data for addressing a question about a difference of means. Remember, it's not two quantitative variables. It's one quantitative variable because we need to make sure that we are comparing means of the same quantitative measure. And the categorical variable is what defines the grouping. So the categorical variable really can only have two different values for this kind of situation. So we need to go to descriptive statistics for one quantitative and one categorical variable in StatKey. So let's go ahead and open that nutrition study data set. Here in StatKey, under descriptive statistics and graphs, I'm going to one quantitative and one categorical variable. And I'm going to upload file. I'm going to sort these by name and scroll down to the ends to find nutritionstudy.csv. Ketale is my quantitative variable. Smoke is my categorical variable. And I can see these two distributions now. They do look like they have a bit of right skew right? Quite a bit. Um, they look similarly shaped and they look even not that far off from each other. So it's not that clear we're going to see a difference here. And also coming up to our sample sizes, we see they're both greater than 30. So that should be able to handle some amount of skew in our population or in our sample as we go into the T distribution. Now what we're going to do is write down the values for sample size, mean, and standard deviation, leaving out these overall values, just going for the no and yes in our notes. And I'll choose to just follow the same order in which they showed up in stat key and say that these go with my no and these go with my yes. We definitely need to keep track of that. So my sample size for no is 272, a lot more non-smokers than smokers. The mean BMI is 26.389, and my standard deviation is 6.145. The sample size for my smokers is much smaller at 43. Mean is 24.695, and standard deviation 4.915. So right away we can see that at least in our sample, the mean BMI actually appears to be a little bit lower among smokers than among non-smokers. My hypotheses, null hypothesis, is that the two means are the same, but now we're talking about population means, so we never write the hypotheses in terms of x bar. This is going to be mu sub n equals mu sub y. And my alternative hypothesis, remember the question was, is there any difference in BMI among smokers and non-smokers? I want a two-sided alternative hypothesis here. Makes things a little bit easier. We don't have to be too concerned about what direction we're going. So we have a two-tailed test. Also remember that uh, each of these hypotheses can be written in terms of a difference of parameters. Mu sub n minus mu sub y equals zero. Mu sub n minus mu sub y is not equal to zero. This is often really necessary to do if you have a one-tail test, just to make sure you stay very consistent about everything. With a two-tail test, you can afford to be a little bit less careful. Okay, so our sample statistic is xn bar minus xy bar. I'm staying in the same order that I subtracted my parameters here. And that is going to be 26.389 minus 24.695, which turns out to be 1.694. The correct degrees of freedom, I can see of my two ends up here, I have a 272 and I have a 43. I'm going to choose the smaller of the two and subtract one to get 42 degrees of freedom. It's okay to go ahead and just choose in table A the closest line. So we'll use 40 
when we get to table A because there isn't a line corresponding to 42. It's okay to be conservative and go down a little bit. It's also okay to just take whatever's closest. We're not that concerned because it only differs in the thousandths place. So when we get to table A, we'll just use the row corresponding to 40 degrees of freedom. And uh, the standard error applet, we're going to look up in Blackboard in order to calculate the standard error. Just like with difference between two proportions, there's a direct link in the section corresponding to this material. So if I click on this standard error applet link, it takes me exactly where I want to go. Or if I'm out of this context and just want to get to a standard error calculator, way down here under external links, this gets me to a more general map, and I would look for SE for the difference of sample means from independent samples and click on that. This gets me to the same place ultimately. So I'm going to enter my standard deviation and sample size from both of my samples. Sample 1 has a standard deviation of 6.145. Remember that we don't actually use the means here at all. The uh, standard error estimate is only based on spread and sample size. So don't get mixed up between your standard deviation and your mean. For 0.915 for my standard deviation and 43 for my sample size and compute standard error. You can see we get the precise degrees of freedom here. That's based on that Satterthwaite formula I was talking about. You don't have to use these, but uh, if you ever want to at some point in the future, you certainly can. Um, the smaller of the two, n minus 1, will be sufficient for everything we do. And our standard error estimate is 0 0.8370. All right, so our T statistic, recalling this nice formula, is our sample statistic of 1.694 divided by the standard error of 0.837, and that gets us 2.024. At this point, we will complete the hypothesis test using a t-distribution. This is what our p-value curve would look like. It's centered at the null parameter or null value of zero. Our sample statistic is over here. That's my xn bar minus xy bar equals 1.694. And we want two tails, so I'm going to put a mirrored little mark over here and draw in both tails. So I've got a tail on the right and a tail on the left. And we can use table A first and then go into stat key for a more accurate estimate to get that p-value. So using table A, I said we would go ahead and use the row corresponding to 40 degrees of freedom because there is no 42. Our T statistic is between 2.021 and 2.423, but really in this case it's so close to 2.021 that I would be inclined to go ahead and just use that instead of trying to go between two values. If you come out really, really close to one, I think it's okay to go ahead and say you got a precise value from here. So our two-tail area corresponding to that, whoops, make sure I have the right column. Okay, so we're three columns in. Our two-tail area is going to be exactly 0.05. So our p-value is close to 0.05. And let's go ahead and see what stack key says it is. Going to theoretical distributions t and using our conservative degrees of freedom and two tail and 1.694. We can see 0.049 Sorry about that. In my head, I remembered the 
value of our sample statistic, not the value of our t statistics. That's 2.024. Doesn't happen very often that they're both in the same range and possible to mix up. That's better. Okay, so using our t statistic of 2.024, we see that we have 0.025 in each tail, so same thing, right? So we get the p-value is close to 0.05 using either stat key or table A. If we were talking about reject or fail to reject at the 0.05 level, you could almost go either way. I would go ahead and reject, um, but we're not looking at a uh, specific significance level here, so we're going to just describe this as strong or moderate to strong evidence. So I'll go ahead and write a conclusion in context using non-technical language. So there's moderate to strong evidence that BMI differs between smokers and non-smokers in this population. We're being, again, a little bit vague about what our population is here. And it's worth noting that the higher BMI is seen among non-smokers. Our alternative hypothesis was two-sided, but we can still make a statement about which group seems to have the higher mean.